Everyone wants to learn voice AI in 2025, but not everyone's sure on how all the pieces come together. How does a user go from VAPI to the automation platform, to log in the call details into the business owner CRM, to the end user receiving an SMS confirmation from Twilio? Well, in today's video, I'm gonna be breaking down the architecture behind the system so you have a better idea of what's going on underneath the hood. My name is Quincy. I'm the founder of Good Looking AI, and we build voice AI phone systems for businesses to turn missed calls into more revenue. Let's dive in. At a high level, all voice AI systems consist of five core layers. The first one being is the call layer. These are platforms like Vapi, Retel, or Bland. Whatever the use case may be for you, this is where our conversational AI system lives that engages with the user. The second layer is the automation layer. These are platforms like Make, Zapier, N8N, or even a custom backend. This is our orchestrator where we build the workflows that enables our AI assistant to perform specific actions. The third layer is the data layer. So we can use vector databases like Pinecone for knowledge retrieval, or we can use Postgres databases like uh, Superbase, or for a simpler approach, we can use Airtable. And the fourth layer is the business layer. So here we want to align our AI assistant with the technologies that the company is already using. So we want to align or integrate our AI systems with CRM tools such as ClickUp, Salesforce, HubSpot, or even Go High Level. And the fifth layer is the engagement layer. This is where we send out SMSs or confirmation emails to the user, providing a whole end-to-end -end experience. Now, if any of these components break, it can ruin the customer experience. So let's go into each component one by one. So the call layer. For this example, let's discuss around VAPI, but most of these other platforms are going to be very similar. Now, there are four core things that you should understand that's going on underneath the hood. The very first thing is real-time speech from the user. That gets converted into text, and then that text gets sent to an LLM for reasoning. And then that text gets converted back out to speech that goes back to the user. Another thing is the tool calling that allows our AI assistant to perform specific actions. The third is call control. This is where we configure call transfers, what destinations they, be, they should be sent to, uh, voicemail detection, and barge in. And then the fourth is streaming events. These are things like call started, tool called, or call updated. If you go to the call logs, you can see a detailed breakdown of what's going on every second while a user is interacting with the AI. So just to simplicate it uh, further with a visual, I have a diagram. So in this example, we have a user, and let's say they, they're engaging with the AI, and they say, I want to book an appointment. Now, what's really going on underneath the hood? So VAPI takes that in as the real-time speech, and that gets converted from speech to text using a speech-to-text provider such as DeepGram. Now, that text gets sent to an LLM. This could be your GPT-4.0, your GPT-4.1, whatever it may be, Claude, Gemini. This is where it processes the query and reasons. And when it processes the query, it returns a response in form of a text. And then that gets sent to a text-to-speech provider such as Eleven Labs. And then VAPI receives that. Now, this whole process creates something called latency. So latency is the time that it takes from the user to speak something and returning something back from the AI assistant. Now, our goal as a developer is to keep that as low as possible. If we build solutions with high latency, it will lead to poor user experience where there'll be a lot of pauses, which can lead to the user saying hello, hello, and then sometimes even having the AI assistant and the user speak at the same time. And this is just a catastrophe. It can lead to not a good time. So understanding how to minimize latency is going to be critical. If you want to learn more about that, I provide a link below in the description so you can learn on how to optimize latency in your AI systems. Now, in the scenario, the user says, I want to book an appointment. So behind the scenes, VAPI handles this whole reasoning. VAPI understands that, okay, I need to use a tool, right? And that's going to be check calendar. So this hits our uh, automation backend where we check the calendar availability and we return that response. We return that availability 
And then that then gets returned back to the user. Something like, I have 2 p.m. tomorrow available. So think of Vappy as the brain. This is where all the magic happens. When your assistant needs to trigger tools like uh, get appointment information or get customer history or whatever it may be, it triggers these tools and hits our backend automation platform like Make, N8N, or our custom backend. Now let's move to the next layer. So here we have the automation layer. Now again, a simple example breakdown, let's say a user says, 2 p.m. works for me, book me in. Now, Vappy again does that whole behind the scenes reasoning thing, and then it reasons and understands, okay, I need to use my book appointment tool. Now, what's going on is it's going to hit our backend. In this case, we have make, but where is that data getting sent to? It's getting sent to a webhook. Now, a webhook kind of just waits for any data that hits its URL endpoint. Now, the data that's getting sent back and forth is JSON which is JavaScript object notation, and it's just structured data that makes it easier for these, uh, just for computers to understand the, the different data and also helps us understand the data that's being sent back and forth. So the webhook receives its payload and then it performs steps. So let's say step one, step two, and then implement all the steps and then we return that response back to VAPI, which is the JSON response. Now. What's happening, right? So our automation platform can handle things like executing business logic, talking to different APIs. APIs are application programming interface. And to explain it simply, it's just how different softwares communicate with each other. Another thing that these automation platforms can do is update the database. And then lastly, always returning structured data, JSON back to VAPI, right? In this case, it would be the result you're all set. So in short, the automation layer is the command center, and this is where you define how smart your AI can be, depending on how you build out your workflows on Make and 8N or on your custom backend. So the third layer is the data layer. Now, what if our AI needs memory context? What if it needs to remember previous conversations that it had with users? So here, again, I have a very simple diagram flow to explain it visually. So let's say we have a user, named Ashley. So they say something like, hey, this is Ashley. Can I reschedule my appointment? Vappy again does that whole behind the scenes reasoning thing. And then it silently triggers a tool to query the user by the phone number. Now this hits our backend. In this case, it's make. The webhook receives the payload. It goes to the next step, which is to hit our backend database. So here for this example, we're going to use Superbase. Right. And we're going to query by the phone number in our table. So this is what essentially it looks like when we store data in a database, especially when we're working with Superbase. So we have this table with IDs with different columns. So you have name, status, appointment date, and we would probably have another column for phone number, previous call history, whatever it may be. It's going to query for this user in our database. So here, okay, we found Ashley. We can see her appointment right at 10 a.m. So that gets returned back to make, right? To our, our uh, what's handling, which is being handled by our Superbase module. And then that goes to the next step, returns a response back, which has Ashley's data. And then the output is something like, hey, Ashley, I already see your booking here. Do you prefer morning or afternoon? And what day are you thinking? So in this scenario, VAPI is connecting to our database which is going to store all the previous history the appointments uh, that the user is booked in for and again this is going to elevate our ai system to not just be static but have that memory in place so it can remember all the previous conversations so in most cases beginners would use something like google sheets or even Airtable, and it's good it's a it's a simple solution and it's more of a tier one solution but in production memory can evolve as customer history, lead stages, appointment count, notes from previous calls, tags, preferences, and intent summaries. Now, as the customer database grows, right, that's more and more and more memory, which can decrease the performance if we're not using the correct database. So using something like Superbase would be a good tier two option. Now, Superbase isn't going to be ideal 
for all types of scenarios, right? It's going to be good for tracking customer history calls, uh, lead stages, appointment count, and all that. But what if we have a system with a really large prompt? And in that prompt, we have a lot of lines of business knowledge. Well, if we have a large prompt, that's going to increase the token size of our system. And that prompt, that large prompt is going to be sent back and forth to the LLM every single time, which is going to increase latency, increase costs, and decrease in performance. So a way around that is to use platforms like Pinecone, a vector database, where we can store business knowledge, documents, PDFs, where this information gets broken down into chunks. It gets embedded. What I mean by that is it gets broken down into chunks and then it gets converted into numbers, essentially array of numbers, where the AI can go into the vector database and search for the, the numbers that match most to what the user is trying to query for. I know it's a little confusing, but just understand that Superbase is good for storing this type of data. And if we need to store business knowledge, hours of operation, product catalog, specific pricing, and then we can use a different type of database, a vector database such as Treve or Pinecone. Essentially, this data layer is what allows our AI assistants to stop acting like a robot or start acting like a real employee that actually has context of certain information. Again, providing a good user experience and increasing the value of our AI solutions. Now, the next layer is going to be the business layer. So for example, let's say a user wants to book an appointment, right? So Vapi understands that I need to use my uh, book appointment tool. So it invokes that tool, hits our backend, right? That payload gets sent to the webhook. We go to Superbase, we update the information on Superbase, and then we move to the next step. We return the response back to Vapi. So a 200 status, anything in the 200 family means it's successful, right? And then we return that status. So the booking is confirmed. And then behind the scenes in automation, it moves to the next step, which is to log the details to the CRM. So we push the business, uh, we push the, the information, the, the, the details to the business CRM where we can log stuff like upcoming appointments. In here, for an example, we have Ashley for her deep tissue repair appointment. We have Kate for her hot cup session. We have John scheduled in for the new consultation, right? So this CRM is going to handle stuff like deal updates, tasks to follow up, appointment logging, and pipeline movement. This is going to be the client side interface that they log in to understand what's going on with the interactions between the user and the AI system. Now, the last layer is the engagement layer. So in this example, we have an SMS that gets sent as confirmation to the user. So the user says something like, reschedule me in for 10 a.m. Vapi again handles that thing behind the scenes, a speech to text, goes to the LLM for reasoning, and then text to speech, back to the user. And then uh, the assistant says something like, you're all set, an SMS will be sent to you shortly. Now, behind the scenes, the assistant has a specific tool it knows that it needs to invoke the SMS tool, so it triggers that. And then Twilio initiates the SMS to the user. And the user gets an SMS, something like, for an example, hey, Ashley, thanks for booking with us. Your appointment is scheduled for Friday 28th at 10 a.m. Please arrive 10 minutes early. Our address is 1234 Vermont Street. If anything changes, give us a call. And then maybe something like reply stop to opt out. Now here, we're ending the whole workflow with a confirmation back to the user. This is going to be critical. Now, it doesn't need to be done in this way. You can use email confirmations and stuff like that. You can set up automations to uh, set reminders for their appointments. But whatever it may be, ensure that your system has some sort of engagement layer so that the user is not left in the dark. They receive some sort of confirmation. Now, I know this was a lot to take in. And I really tried to simplify this as much as possible. So you get a good painting of a picture of what's going on underneath the hood and know the difference between a system that's good for demos and a system that would be ideal for production. If you're a business owner that's looking to integrate AI into your business to save time, 
stop missing out on calls, increase revenue, feel free to book a discovery call down with me below. If you're a developer new to this game and want to learn how to build these voice AI solutions, feel free to give me a follow, like, and subscribe. You can also book a consultation call with me down below for hands-on assistance with your AI projects. Again, my name is Quincy. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.